Is all the praise and adoration for the new MacBook Pro M1 valid, or are we seeing another series of fanboying or fangirling for another piece of tech being slightly faster, lighter, and more expensive? Well, in this case, it's actually cheaper. But anyway, in this video, I'm going to dig into the details for video editors, photographers, graphic designers to see if this laptop lives up to the hype. Let's get rocking. If you're new to the channel, my name is Benji Kaiser. This is where you're going to find the best tech and tools for creative professionals. If that sounds like your kind of place, consider subscribing. And also, if you're curious about the exact pricing of the new MacBook Pro M1 or the availability, you can head down in the description below and click one of those links. Now, if you do make a purchase through that link, I will get a small commission, but at no extra cost to you. And that's what keeps this channel alive and the helpful content coming your way. The 2020 MacBook Pro 13-inch M1 is really turning heads with the exact same design as the previous model with the Intel i5. I'm, I'm joking. I will say that Apple has perfected the design and feel of the MacBook Pro over the past few years, especially stepping back into the scissor switch keyboard following the disastrous butterfly keyboard. However, I will say Apple is really hanging on to their beloved touch bar, which I honestly don't think met a single person who said, wow, I like this touch bar has changed my life. If you're a touch bar fan, uh, please comment below and prove me wrong that the touch bar has truly changed your life. Okay, so it's the same design, shape, and weight. Three pounds at 0.6 inches thick. So the big news, of course, is the new M1 chip, which has proved to be rather useful in providing more battery life out of the same 58.2 watt hour battery. It is able to get roughly 15 hours of web browsing battery life and roughly eight to nine hours of work slash design battery life. Video editing in Premiere Pro will pull that down quite a bit due to the non-native Rosetta emulation process, which has to work extra hard to translate the app to be usable on Apple Silicon. So with that in mind, you can expect roughly six hours of battery life while editing in Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve at this time. Uh, when it goes native Apple Silicon, we might see a change. Let's talk about what makes the M1 chip so impressive. When comparing laptops, components, and the latest tech to, say, older stuff, you have to compare apples to apples, all pun intended, to really understand the relevant improvements of the latest gear. After we discuss the why, we will then look at a boatload of benchmarks to see if this laptop is right for your creator needs. If you want to skip straight to the benchmarks, I have put timestamps in the description below. First off, let's talk about the TDP. For a crash course in TDP, here is what you need to know. TDP is used to measure the amount of heat a component is expected to output when under intense workloads. This is thermal watts, not electrical watts, and that's a common confusion. In the past, more watts often equaled better performance, but higher temperatures and more power consumption. When a CPU is rated to have a high TDP, it means that it generates a lot of heat. Heat is a byproduct of electricity, and that means that you can look at the dissipated heat of a processor, its TDP, to estimate how much power the processor needs. Okay, now why does this matter? Well, the average TDP of an Ultrabook, which is the category of the MacBook Pro fits into, is anywhere from 15 watts to 35 watts of TDP. The new MacBook Pro M1 has a TDP of 10 watts, which means it produces less heat, and as a result, the system is able to increase the performance of the chip while still running cool and not kicking on the fans. That's a big win. In comparison, the 2020 Intel MacBook Pro with its i5, 10, 38, and G7 produces 28 watts of TDP. It runs hotter, which kills the efficiency, and you end up with a lot of fan noise while working on your computer, which has been a big complaint of a lot of users in the past and currently. A similar Ultrabook, such as the Acer Spin 5, runs the i7 1065G7 at 15 watts of TDP, allowing it to run more efficiently than the 2020 Intel MacBook Pro 13 inch, but not as efficient as the M1 chip. Okay, so TDP is something to definitely take note of with the new M1 chip. The second big advancement is the smaller nanometer process. The Apple M1 chip is tiny at five nanometers per transistor. The new chip has a big advantage over any mainstream consumer chip on the market. The upper end ultra books on the market have either a seven nanometer process from AMD or a 10 nanometer process from Intel. And when I say the chip is smaller, I mean the transistors on the chip. So quickly let's define nanometers and transistors, then we'll discuss why the size is important. 
What are nanometers signifying? The number seven nanometer, for example, defines the distance between the transistors and other components within the CPU. The smaller the number, the more transistors that can be placed within the same area, allowing for a faster, more efficient processor design. What are transistors? A transistor is a binary switch, basically, and a fundamental building block of a computer circuitry. Like a light switch on a wall, the transistor either prevents or allows current to flow through. A single modern CPU can have hundreds of millions or even billions of transistors. The new MacBook Pro M1 chip actually has around 16 billion transistors. Transistors are the switches and the nanometer is the size and or distance between each one, for lack of an obsessive explanation. With these two terms defined, Denard scaling should now make sense. Denard scaling observes that transistor dimensions could be scaled by 30%, or 0.7 times, every technology generation, thus reducing their area by 50%. This would reduce circuit delays by 30% and therefore increase operating frequency by about 40% or 1.4 times. In layman's terms, when the size of the transistor is shrunk, the number of the transistors on the CPU can increase and the clock speed along with it. Since the new M1 chips have five nanometer transistors and the Intel chipped MacBook Pro has 10 nanometer transistors, we will in turn see at least a 1.4 times increase in performance and efficiency, which is almost exactly what we're seeing. The Intel MacBook Pro reached a Cinebench score of 5014, whereas the new MacBook Pro M1 chip scored a 7766, which is actually better than Denard scaling predicts, capturing a 1.54 times increased performance compared to the Denard scaling prediction of 1.4 times. Now again, back to our comparing apples to apples scenario. Is the new M1 chip better? Yes. It is unbelievably better. Is it more affordable? Yes, the base model M1 chip is $500 cheaper than the Intel when comparing base models. But when compared to laptops, say, such as the MacBook Pro 16 or the Asus Zephyrus G14 or the HP Omen, all of which you can watch my head-to-head -head reviews in the YouTube cards above after this video is finished, of course. Compared to all of those, the Apple MacBook Pro M1 does not outperform them in real-world applications, such as Premiere Pro, Photoshop, After Effects, and DaVinci Resolve, to name a few. The reason being, today, we sit without Apple Silicon native apps from the leading creator tools. So the computer has to use Rosetta to emulate the process. Right before we get into the performance benchmarks, I wanna highlight one other thing, the color gamut range and color accuracy of the MacBook Pro M1. This laptop can reach 303 nits at full brightness and has a color gamut range of 100% sRGB, 89% Adobe RGB, and 100% DCI-P3, all at an average Delta E of 1.18. Very respectable, but I must be honest, I'm surprised that it did not snag 100% Adobe RGB. Now, there are a lot of people out there who value DCI-P3 over Adobe RGB. Um, as they say, it is a better range, but I'll leave that up to your own research and if you want to split hairs over the exact differences between each one. Okay, as promised, let's get into the benchmarks to see if you should indeed buy the new MacBook Pro M1 or perhaps pick up one of the other laptops mentioned just a few moments ago. For clarity's sake, I'm reviewing the base model. I did this for the purpose of wanting to see what entry-level laptop was capable of. I did upgrade the size of the storage drive just to make sure I had enough space to run all of my tests, but this in no way helps the performance. The CPU is the Apple M1 with eight cores and eight threads. The GPU is the eight core GPU plus the 16 core neural engine. The RAM is eight gigs and the storage is 512 gigs of SSD. Starting out in Cinebench R20, um, or now we're in R23, you can see that the M1 is beating out every computer I have had on my channel with a score of 7,766. In Geekbench 5 single core, the M1 stands out on top again with a score of 1,733 for single core, but does not take the top spot for multi-core due to its mere eight cores and scores a 7,578, which is still a great score, just not the top spot. These are incredible benchmarks, but let's not forget that a computer for creative professionals, especially video editors, motion designers, and 3D modelers don't rely solely on a great CPU. Those three use cases capitalize on also complementing your computer with a powerful GPU to run smooth workflows. So let's not get too excited over these benchmarks as they are impressive in a testing environment but not necessarily a guaranteed win in a real world application, uh, which we will get into in just a minute. So let's start things off with the Photoshop benchmark. I use this benchmark to see how well a laptop can handle the most intense tool in Adobe's design suite. If a laptop can perform well in Photoshop, it will handle InDesign and Illustrator with ease. 
In Photoshop, you can see that the MacBook Pro M1 is sitting around the mid to bottom end of my test results at a 565, but it is about 120 points faster than the MacBook Pro with the Intel i5 chip. Um, so in regards to the price range that this laptop sits, okay, right, it's about a 1300-ish dollar laptop right now, compared to say, you know, up near the top of the chart, you have anywhere from 1800 to $3,000 laptops. This is a great, great benchmark score. Um, so we've seen the Denard scaling be accurate here as well, and that's at least a 1.4 times increase over last year's MacBook Pro uh, Intel chip, as you see scoring about a 422, versus the new MacBook Pro M1 with a 565. So great improvements, but like I said, this is not the best computer you can buy for Photoshop. So apples to apples. Again, we're trying to keep that scenario in our minds. Um, you can also use this chart as a reference if you're considering other design or photography focused software such as Affinity Photo um, or design software such as Sketch and Figma. Okay, so now that we know this laptop can handle the Adobe Design Suite, let's check out how it can handle motion design inside of After Effects. As you can see, the MacBook Pro is pulling off a 461 in After Effects Puget Systems benchmark test. But do note that this is with 16 gigs of RAM. So I have a fellow YouTuber friend that has a 16 gig model and he shared some benchmarks with me since I was unable to run the test with the eight gig model. So keep that in mind, you may not be able to get all the performance out of the MacBook Pro M1 if you are stuck at eight gigs of RAM. I recommend you get that upgrade to 16 to make sure you're able to run After Effects if you're wanting to run that program. Okay, now onto my favorite portion of the benchmark test, video editing in Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve. First, I'm going to start off with a playback test. For this test, I'm going to use a nine minute 4K clip, adding some motion graphics, and then playing it back in the timeline at full quality. This clip contains 16,177 frames in total, with 7,240 of those frames being motion graphics. During this test, the MacBook Pro M1 saw drop frame rates as follows. At full quality, 5,481 out of the 16,177 frames. At half quality, 375, and at fourth quality, zero drop frames. So when I said earlier that this is a big upgrade from the i5 Intel MacBook Pro 13 inch, but would not be my go-to for a complete video editing replacement computer, I would be much more comfortable with say the 16 inch MacBook Pro or a Gigabyte Aero 15. I stand firm with that decision because we're seeing that without the dedicated GPU, this laptop is not able to perform such smooth video editing experience as we would hope inside of DaVinci Resolve and the Premiere Pro software. Now, DaVinci Resolve does run smoother. Um, you are not gonna notice many drop frames. It's gonna be a smoother experience because they've really worked on optimizing their program. And in, again, with Final Cut Pro, because that is a Mac, uh, pro, Mac, Mac Apple Silicone product. Um, so definitely, if you're gonna be using this computer and you wanna do some big 4K video edits, I would definitely lean you towards Final Cut as of this moment, as we're seeing some lagginess um, inside of Premiere Pro as far as drop frames are concerned. Okay, so to render out the 7,240 frames of motion design in that project, it took seven minutes and 43 seconds, which is honestly a pretty good time being that this laptop does not have a full dedicated GPU. Moving on to the 4K export test, I'm gonna take a nine minute 4K clip, place it into Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve using the free version of Resolve, then export both out at 1080p and 4K YouTube settings. The Premiere Pro 4K to 4K export took five minutes and 51 seconds. The 4K to 1080p export took nine minutes and 15 seconds. The DaVinci Resolve 4K to 4K export took seven minutes and 45 seconds. And the 4K to 1080p export took two minutes and 57 seconds. One of the most outstanding benefits of the new MacBook Pro M1 chip is the silence. There is no fan noise no matter the task I perform. Now, as Matthew Menez noted, he ran a Cinebench R23 test and at around the 10 minute mark as he was repeating that test over and over, the fans did kick on. But that is an intense benchmark to run for 10 minutes straight. Pretty crazy it can go that long without kicking on the fans. Now, regarding use case for this laptop, if you are a graphic designer or photographer, there is no question that this would be a lightning fast laptop for you. Running Lightroom, Camera Raw, and Photoshop all simultaneously, and you should see no hiccup. Now, if you're really wanting to see this laptop take on your full-time video editing machine inside of Premiere Pro or DaVinci Resolve, and you're shooting multi-cam 4K cameras and trying to edit them all together, I strongly caution you against this being your pick in the regards to the current circumstances that these are not a native apps on Apple Silicon. 
Now, what I mean by this is Adobe and Blackmagic have not made Apple Silicon native apps. The laptop is running Rosetta. However, I have seen other reviews praise Final Cut Pro for its speed and smoothness. So if you are thinking 4K video editing with lots of motion graphics, layers, music, effects, then I would go for the 16 inch MacBook Pro or one of the others I mentioned earlier. This will currently serve you as the best Premiere Pro and DaVinci Resolve while we're waiting for Apple to you know, get the apps native on their platform. Here's about the exact pricing and availability. You can click the link in the description below. And remember that is an affiliate link. And if you do make a purchase with that link, I will get a small commission, but at no extra cost to you. And that's to keep this channel alive and the helpful content coming your way. If you wanna watch more videos about the MacBook Pro M1, you can click or tap the screen over here. Otherwise, keep editing. Keep designing, keep creating. I'm Benji Kaiser, and I'll see you here in the next video.